The idea of a private bath to these 19th century Shakers was virtually an unknown. They shared everything. For instance, this retiring room or bedroom was shared by four sisters. And we've been told that they were satisfied just having a table with a basin and a pitcher filled with water, along with a bar of very harsh looking soap. And down below, on a little swivel to keep it out of the way, the chamber pot. Another thing that surprises me is that for four sisters, they were only allowed one small looking glass or mirror. And they just hung it on these classic shaker pegs that were all around the room. And look at over here, they even hung a chair up on it that wasn't being used. Now we looked all over the museum to try to find a cabinet or a chest with a mirror on it. We found plenty of little ones like this and even some bigger ones like this one, which is nicely made of pine with shelves on the inside and a very nice overhang detail at the top. But we couldn't find any with a mirror on. So maybe there's a way that I can combine the looking glass with a nice cabinet like this and come up with something that even a Shaker sister would accept. An awful big order, though. Well, for my medicine cabinet, I think I'm going to use some red oak because it's that hard wood that can take all the abuse that, that cabinet's going to get while it's being used. So I went down to my hardwood supplier and picked up some 1x6 to make the case of the cabinet. And then I ripped some stock down to 2 inches, one set for the face frame, one set for the frame on the door. Then I picked up some quarter-inch oak plywood, and uh, I was a little bit shocked at the price of it, but it's going to do a great job, and it looks good. One piece is going to be for the back of the mirror, and one piece is going to be for the back of the cabinet. Then I picked up a piece of oak about eight inches wide, and that'll be the top shelf. Now let's go over to the prototype and take a look and see how this thing is built. The case is put together with these finger joints. And I have one up here that's not glued up, and I can show you how it works. It's just little fingers, actually, that stick out and interlock with one another. And it's not only an attractive joint, but it's a very strong joint because there's an extraordinary amount of glue surface area. Now, to make the joint, we're going to use the table saw. And it's set up with a dado head cutter, and in this case, a two-blade cutter, which is adjustable for varying widths of material that you want to remove. And the real key to making the joint, this little jig. Not something that I just made up you know, on my own. It's something that's been around cabinet shops for a long, long time. And it's pretty simple to make. It's just a piece of wood with a couple dados cut in it. One here, 3 eighths of an inch wide. Then a 3 eighths of an inch space. And another dado, 3 eighths of an inch, which is filled with this little pin, which I screwed on from the bottom. And what you do is, using your T-square, you take the jig and you fasten it to your T-square with a couple screws. And I'll show you how this works. The first cut you make is with a little guide stick, a 3 eighths of an inch thick guide stick. And you put that up against the pin, slide a piece of material in, and make that first cut on one piece. Then butt that piece up against the pin and take your next piece and without that little guide stick, slip it up against the pin. Pass through, it cuts both pieces at the same time. And after each pass, you just move over one slot, drop it down over the pin, and make the next pass. And when you're finished at the end, you'll get two pieces of wood that'll fit together perfectly, and a joint that's not, not many other joints that are stronger than this. So let's do some for real.
let's take a look inside our prototype medicine cabinet. And you'll see that before I can assemble this case, I have to drill some holes in the side pieces like these. And that's for these little clips that go in. They're shelf clips, and they'll help hold up our glass shelves. Now, there's quite a few holes to drill, and you want them to come out exactly spaced, so it's worth setting up a jig over here on the drill press. And what I did is took a piece of one by four and put markings at every inch all the way down the length of it. Then, when I fastened it to my rip fence, I just made sure it was squarely aligned with the drill bit. Then I made an adjustment to the drill press so that when I drill down, it won't go through. It'll just drill the right depth. And using a quarter inch brad point bit, I'll be able to drill my holes. Now, I didn't want to start right at the bottom because you're never going to have a shelf that close to the bottom. So I felt that four inches away would be the appropriate distance. So I have put an S here to mark my starting point. And then over here on the other side, I put another S for my stop point. Okay, a little bit of yellow glue spread out with my brush here. And I'll be able to fit these corners together using a little gentle persuasion from my rubber mallet. So I think I better check that case for square before the glue sets up. Let's see, I'll set this on the inside. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Now, I didn't forget the clamps. I think the joint's tight enough that it's going to hold itself together. But I do want to let the glue set up, so I'll let that stay there. And we'll go back over here and look at the prototype. I think we'll start working on this face frame. This is what the door hangs on. And these joints down here are made by using half lap joints. And if we look at the outside of the cabinet here, and I'll wet the joint a little bit so you can see it better. You can see that it sticks through half the thickness of the material. And I'll make that joint over on my which I set up the dado head cutter, and then adjusted the height of the saw so that it's going to remove just half the thickness of the material. And I put guidelines of where I want to make the cuts. Okay, a little more yellow glue on this half lap joint. Set those together. And I'm going to drill some little pilot holes, really necessary. So whenever we nail or screws in, these screws are not going to show because they're on the back side of the face frame. And they're really only here to hold the joint together while the glue sets up. With the set up on my case, I'm ready to sand out those box joints. But I have a little bit of a problem in that there's some little spaces here. I'm going to show you a little trick I learned how to fix those. You take some glue and you put a little bit in each one of those cracks. Then you can take the bag off your sander and dump out some sawdust, the same oak. And then just take that and spread it in all those little gaps. And then when you run the sander over it again, no one's ever going to know those spaces were there. OK, the next thing that I want to do is put a rabbit in the back of my case to accept the plywood that's going to go in. Here. And to do that, I use my router with a 3 8 inch rabbiting bit. And I'll just plunge in and go around. Now, the problem is, is that I have a narrow board here for the router to sit on. So I'll hold it steady and just go slowly. Now, 
Now, the wrapping bit doesn't give me a square corner here. It leaves a little bit of a radius there. So I'll clean out that area with a nice, sharp chisel. A little more yellow carpenter's glue. And I'm ready to put the back on. Of course, making sure that the oak side is facing the inside of the case. And I'll fasten it in place using some one-inch drywall screws. Remember, none of these are going to show because this cabinet will be screwed onto a wall somewhere. <laughs> Meanwhile, we'll put a little more glue on the front edges of the cabinet, and we're ready to set the face frame. Now, I'll hold the face frame even with the top of the case and about an inch over each side and the bottom. I've pre-drilled a hole here to fasten it with some four-penny finish nails. You drive the nails in, set them, and later they'll be filled so that they don't show. Well, now I'm ready to start working on the door for the medicine cabinet. I could have joined the pieces together with a half-lap joint like I did on the face frame, but the trouble with that is when I open the door, I will see those screws that are in the back of a half lap. So I chose to do a mortise joint, a through mortise. If I wet the end of this here, you can see a little bit better where the mortise comes through. And that's held in place by a couple dowels. Now, another thing I'm going to have to do is put a groove in all these pieces to hold the mirror in place. And that's the first step in the operation. I've got my pieces, and I've set up the saw with the dado head cutter again. And it's set up to be a little bit more than a quarter of an inch wide, and it's about 7 sixteenths of an inch high, centered in each piece. The next thing to do is put a mortise at the top and bottom of each style. And that's best done by just using an ordinary saw blade in the table saw, because the dado head just doesn't come up high enough for this deep of a mortise. have clear space in here so I won't have I shouldn't have any problems with kickback Okay, that's it for the shoulder cut. Now I need to make the cheek cut, which is along this direction right here. And I've readjusted the saw, moved the fence a little bit closer, and now we're ready to do that. Okay, with the frame dry fit together, I'll bring it over and set it on my face frame, because I know my face frame is square. So I'm check the door frame, and that lines up pretty good. I've also marked on these corners where I want to drill the holes for the quarter-inch dowels, which will hold everything together. And I'm ready to drill those over here on the drill press, where I've set up a quarter-inch brad point bit, and I've clamped a piece of wood to the table, and that's so that when the bit passes all the way through, it won't splinter out on the bottom. Right now I'm just going to slide the mirror in. I've already pinned the joints down here at the bottom, and I've got some glue on the top joint, so I'll just get those set in here like this. And now I'm going to 
have to stand it up to drive that the rest of the way down. And boy, hammers and mirrors. I hope I don't end up with seven years bad luck. Okay, now I can set it back down flat. Take these little quarter inch dolls and just put a little bit of glue on them. And then drive those in through my pre-drilled holes. Now the best way to remove the excess hardwood doll is just to use the belt sander. Now let's look back at our prototype and you'll see that the outside edges of the door are also rounded over. And that's a 3 8 inch radius round over and I've set up a bit in my router and I'm ready to run that. Okay, the next thing I want to do is attach the door to the face frame. And I'm going to use an inch and a half brass plated piano hinge to do that. Now, I suppose I could just surface mount the hinge to the door in the face frame, but I don't think that looks very good. So I use a full mortise, which is much neater and very professional. Now, I suppose you could chisel that out, but it's not an easy thing to do, especially on oak. So I have a way to do that, and I'll show you. The first thing you do is you set the hinge on the back of the door and using a sharp utility knife, scribe the end points of the hinge. Then I'm going to take a router, which is set up with this half inch mortising bit. And that cuts a very smooth surface on the bottom of the mortise. And I've set it up in my router with this guide fence, which controls the width of the cut. Now I'm going to have to cut the ends freehand following those scribe marks but that's not too bad. I just have to be careful. Well, that does a real nice job making a smooth cut. And again, it would be very difficult to chisel this out by hand. The thing I want to make sure, though, is that I keep the router base perfectly flat on the door style. Because if I allow it to tip, it's going to chew out the edge of the door and I'm going to ruin it. Now all I have to do is remove this little piece that's left in the corner and then I'll do exactly the same thing to the face frame. Okay, with the hinge attached to the door, I'll clamp it to the face frame of my case and then being sure to pre-drill some holes in this hard oak, just fasten it with the screws. Oh, that seems to fit pretty good. Now, there's one more thing I want to do, though, to the inside of this door. I don't want to see the back side of this mirror. So I've cut another piece of the quarter-inch oak plywood, and that fits in between the styles and rails of the door frame. And I'll attach that to the mirror with a special mastic that I'll get at my glass center. But I don't want to do that right now. I want to coat the back side of this plywood with a sealer before I fasten it so that it won't absorb any moisture and swell up. Now, the next thing I want to do is make this little shelf that goes on the top. And that's just our piece of 8-inch oak, which has had the corners rounded off and then eased. Well, the first thing I want to do is knock off these corners. And I'm just going to use a good old American quarter for a template. Okay, and then I'll just take my drum sander and remove the material. Well, now I just have to route the rest of it. Now, this router is mounted underneath a router table, and I've set it up with a 3 8 inch radius roundover bit with a pilot bearing. Okay, to attach the top element to the case, I first drill a hole using a countersink bit. And then I'll fasten it with a one inch screw. Then I'll take a 
oak bung. Apply a little bit of glue to it. And that gets set in this hole. And I'll take my belt sander and sand off any of the excess bung. And this piece is ready for some finish. The key to getting a nice finish on any of these pieces is to do them in an environment that's as dust free as possible. That's why I've set up an area that's outside of the shop where all the dust is. And I've done all my sanding out there. And the last thing that I'm going to do is do the final cleanup right here with a tack cloth. It's really just a piece of material like cheesecloth. And it's been treated with some, some kind of a resin that makes it tacky. And that'll pick up any of the remaining residue that might be left on the piece. Now, this first coat is just a sanding sealer. And what it does is it penetrates the wood. And when it's dry, I'll sand it with a very fine sandpaper. And it'll give me a perfectly smooth base for the finished coat. It's starting to look pretty good already. I'll let this dry for a couple hours, and then I'll be ready to sand it. Well, after the sanding sealer dried, I took the medicine cabinet back into the shop and I was able to lightly sand it with some 320 wet dry sandpaper. And when you do that, you end up with a little bit of residue here. I vacuumed most of it off, and the last thing to do is remove the rest of the residue with a tack cloth. And now I have a nice smooth surface for the final coats. This is the first coat of finish, satin polyurethane. And I'll do a coat, let it dry, a little light sanding, and a second coat as the final finish. Now, the key to a nice urethane job is to stir, not shake the can of finish. And as you apply it, use long strokes. Don't go over it a whole bunch of times. And the finishing touch, a little white porcelain knob. And with that, I don't think the medicine cabinet turned out too badly at all. Next time, we're going to build this workbench something that every home workshop needs. Till then, I'm Norm Abram for the new Yankee Workshop.